I have made it to Dayton, Ohio in the U.S. Air Force Museum. And this is not just a museum that somebody put together to honor the Air Force. This is the actual U.S. Air Force sanctioned museum here. So let's go inside and take a look. There's gonna be some good stuff in there. This amazing museum is located a few miles northeast of downtown Dayton, Ohio on what was once called the Wilbur Wright Field. Today it's part of the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. However, the field's runways are now closed to air traffic and flight operations were moved years ago to the main airfield about four and a half miles northeast of here. One of the first things you'll see getting out of your car is this 10-acre memorial park. There are more than 500 plaques, monuments, benches, and other memorials here that commemorate and honor U.S. Army Air Force and U.S. Air Force units and personnel. This one is for the unit my good friend's father served in during World War II. It's just a wonderful, peaceful place to take a stroll. This is called the Early Days Gallery and features early military aircraft up to 1940, just before World War II. Entering the gallery, there are several early radial engines in pristine condition. And a wind tunnel used by the Wright brothers in 1901 to test airfoil and propeller profiles. A really nice replica of a 1909 Wright military flyer the very first aircraft bought by the U.S. Army. And above, an early Curtis aircraft, the second aircraft bought by the Army. A heavy leather crash helmet. Here's a little fancier wind tunnel from 1911. It looks like a piece of art. Hanging from the ceiling is a standard aircraft J-1 trainer from the World War I era. And right below it, a French-designed Spad 7 biplane, both from 1916. A pendant from the 1st Aero Squadron. And there they are, all lined up in the photograph. This one says it's a type of football helmet used by early pilots. Avro 504K. Dating from 1913, this is a British design that was used mostly as a trainer. The Army liked them so much they brought them back to the U.S. and trained pilots for years in this aircraft. Here's a Thomas Morris Scout minus its covering. Dating from 1917, these were commonly called Tommies. Here's a cutaway view of the French Gnome rotary engine. These were a pretty reliable and very popular World War I engine. Notice how the propeller and engine rotate together. While reliable, they did have drawbacks. One was a substantial gyroscopic effect that made turning right difficult. Plus, these engines used castor oil, which always blew back into the pilot's face. Here's another a little bit bigger wind tunnel. Upside down and hanging from the ceiling is a Fokker DR-1. Most will recognize this as the Red Baron's airplane, perhaps made famous by Snoopy. And he's diving on a Sopwith F-1 Camel biplane, a British aircraft, widely flown by both British and American air services. Here's a SPAD-13 which came out later in the war in 1917. It was another very popular fighter with over 8,000 being manufactured. This squadron insignia might look familiar to some. 
It's the 94th Aero Squadron that American ace Edward Rickenbacker was in and also was a popular restaurant back in the 1980s and 90s. Here's another standard aircraft J-1 trainer, also without its skin. Take a look at this baby, an Italian-designed Caproni bomber, one of the first strategic bombers. With a gunner up front and around 1,700 pounds of bombs underneath. Here's a nice-looking Fokker D-7 hanging from the ceiling. This airplane appeared in 1918, late in the war, and proved to be a formidable adversary. Here's another multi-engine bomber, a Martin MB-2. This is a U.S.-designed aircraft and was produced in the early 1920s. After World War I was over, this thing could carry a 3,000-pound bomb load. Check out the folding wing design. Amazing! aeronautical beacon. Most people don't know that the U.S. Postal Service was responsible for developing aviation navigation here in the United States. They set up numerous airmail routes and lit them with light beacons, some like this one, until eventually radio navigation aids took their place. I'm starting to think it's going to take a heck of a lot longer than one day to go through all of this museum. The sign says this is a Mark I 4,300 pound demolition bomb, dating from around 1921. Yep, I'm pretty sure it would only take one of these to completely demolish your house. There's an autogyro, sort of like a helicopter, but they really never caught on. This is a P-26A. It's the Army Air Corps' first all-metal monoplane fighter, nicknamed the Pea Shooter. Next up is a Martin B-10 bomber from the 1930s. This one had two Wright Cyclone round engines that became very popular. You can see airplanes are beginning to look more like the bombers of World War II. Here's a BT-14 that's turned up on its nose by a cadet. Looks like he's got some explaining to do. And directly above is a PT-19A, another primary trainer, this one dating from the early 1940s. I'll finish up in this gallery with two British aircraft, a de Havilland Tiger Moth, mainly used as a trainer in the early 1930s, and a Hawker Hurricane, a well-known World War II British fighter. That will do it for this gallery. It's on to World War II, which will be in the next video. I hope you enjoyed the walkthrough. And remember, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride and thanks for watching.